If you've been following me for a while on Learn Jazz Standards, you know that my philosophy for improving as a jazz musician and becoming a better jazz improviser is to learn jazz standards because the jazz standards will teach you how to play. You'll learn new harmonic concepts. You'll be forced to approach different chord progressions you haven't approached before. And naturally, through that process, you will be forced to learn improv lessons, be forced to listen, be forced to improve by simply going over different harmonic contexts. So in today's episode, I want to share with you 10 jazz standards that I believe will really help expand your knowledge of jazz harmony that are worth your time looking into. Let's dig into it. Welcome to the LJS Podcast, where you get weekly jazz tips, interviews, stories, and advice for becoming a better jazz musician. And now your host, He's a jazz musician, author, and entrepreneur, Brent Bartstra. Hey, what's up, everybody? Brent here from LearnJazzStandards.com, which is a blog, a podcast, and videos all geared towards helping you become a better jazz musician. Excited to be here, as always, and I appreciate you for listening in today. Now, in case you're brand new to this podcast, this is really the show where I teach you how to become a better jazz musician, how to improve your jazz improv skills. And like I said in the intro, a big deal around here at the Learn Jazz Standards community is learning jazz standards, just as the name says, because my philosophy is that if we learn jazz standards, all of the lessons that we need to learn about becoming a better jazz musician will follow along with that. We'll start dealing with songs that have lots of two five one chord progressions in it. And you'll have to learn what a two five one chord progression is, which naturally forces you to have to learn how to improvise over a two five one, which might cause you to look into the chord tones of each one of those chords, which might cause you to figure how do I go from one chord to the next seamlessly, which will lead you to voice leading, which will start to get you into guide tones. What are those important notes in each chord that if we target them, we're going to hear them come out in the chord. And then you'll come across some songs that have some interesting harmony that is isn't like two five ones, stuff that goes to different key centers that are still in the diatonic harmony, so like secondary dominance. Now, you may not know what a secondary dominant is, but you kind of learn this stuff simply by going over the tunes. Even if you don't know what they are right away, you eventually learn because you're digging into the material. Now, my friends, there are no real shortcuts to becoming a better jazz improviser. Now on this show and on my YouTube channel, on my blog, in my eBooks and my courses, of course, we go over things that have to do with theory that, you know, might help you think about things differently. Of course, I do call you to action and and have you learn solos by ear and stuff by ear like that. And those things will help you improve faster, but you do have to put in the work and no, things won't always seem natural. But then again, Learning jazz or learning any style of music is really no different than any other task in life. If we want to improve on it, we have to put in the time and the effort and the work. But I'm here every single week to help you with that, to hold your hand through the process, to give you something new to think about, something new to work on. And so I can't think of anything better, of course, than to suggest some jazz standards for you to work on. Now, I've come out with other episodes that suggest all other kinds of lists. And I like going through lists of jazz standards because maybe one will resonate with you more than the other. So today's list deals with some jazz standards that I think start to push the boundaries of our understanding of jazz harmony. Now, they may not be the absolute first ones I would go to, although some of them I would, but these are ones that really start to expand our knowledge of jazz harmony. So without further ado, let's jump into this list of 10 jazz standards. Now, for those of you who have recently picked up my brand new ebook and companion course, The Jazz Standards Playbook, Volume 2, yes, you will recognize these jazz standards as being the jazz standards that we do study in this book. So if you're someone who uh, hasn't purchased that yet, who hasn't checked that out, and is listening to these jazz standards as I go along with them, and is thinking, hey, I'd like to know these a little bit better, I'd like to do more research, I'd like to have more studies and in-depth material to work on with these, of course, go to the Jazz Standards Playbook 2, that's the number 2.com, jazzstandardsplaybook2.com, and uh, you can find that there. But let's jump right in to what these jazz standards are and uh, what we can learn from each one of them. 
Okay, so let's start off with the first jazz standard, uh, which is There Will Never Be Another You. So this song was written by Harry Warren and with lyrics by Max Gordon. It was written for the 1942 20th Century Fox musical Iceland. Okay, and, and so it's a 32-bar form, A, B, 1, A, B, 2. And uh, it's, it's really just a great study of diatonic harmony with a few important concepts, uh, a few of which I mentioned earlier, like secondary dominance and backdoor dominance. So when you study There Will Never Be Another You, you really learn about secondary dominance and backdoor dominance. Now, if you're listening and you don't know what those are, at all, then when you're done listening to this, you can listen to my episode on secondary and backdoor dominance. That's episode 121. And I'll be sure to uh, include all the links to resources in the show notes today as well. But this is a great study of of those particular concepts. So uh, this is, it's, it's one of those songs where if you know this one, you really understand diatonic harmony and the different things that it can possibly do uh, quite thoroughly. And so I would highly suggest There Will Never Be Another You to study because it's, and many of you know it, but it's one of those songs that just really uh, is going to open up the doors. If you know that one, you're going to know uh, possibly even hundreds of others. I mean, I'm coming up with that number, but you you really are going to know a lot because a lot of jazz standards have to do with that. So There Will Never Be Another You is the first jazz standard I would suggest to expand your knowledge of jazz harmony. Okay, the second jazz standard I want to suggest is Someday my prince will come. So yes, you may recognize that from Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Well, it was adopted by jazz musicians. It was first written by Frank Churchill, lyrics by Frank Morey, uh, again, for that animated film. But then uh, Dave Brubeck uh, included in his album Dave Diggs Disney, and that just became popular with other jazz musicians. And of course, there's that notable recording by Miles Davis in 1961. uh, And he even, his old album was called Someday My Prince Will Come. Uh, And that kind of really solidified an arrangement of that song for jazz musicians. Now, this is a great jazz standard to learn because it's in 3-4. It's a waltz. And this is, of course, uh, something that we need to know as jazz musicians. We need to know how to play uh, tunes in 3-4. So Someday My Prince Will Come is a great one. And the thing that makes it really great to study is is some of the interesting things that happen with the harmony. uh, there's a deceptive cadence in there uh, in the second bar with this D7 sharp five that you think is going to go to the G minor seven, but it doesn't. It goes to the E flat major seven. And just understanding why that works is kind of important. I mean, it's 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 not necessarily something that you see all the time, but to understand how that works is important when you're trying to improvise over it. Uh, there's this concept in there that the three can replace the one chord, right? The three can replace the tonic one chord. Uh, passing diminished chords happen in Someday My Prince Will Come. What's it, what is a passing diminished chord? Why is it important? What is it substituting for? So you start having some diminished harmony in Someday My Prince Will Come. So Someday My Prince Will Come is just packed full of these amazing harmonic lessons, and it's in 3-4, and it's just a beautiful song. So Someday My Prince Will Come is the second one that I want to suggest for you if you want to really start taking your harmonic understanding of jazz to the next level. All right, the next one I want to suggest is Tune Up. Tune Up. Now, this one, uh, it's by Miles Davis, uh, although there is some, uh, Miles Davis is credit for it, but there's some belief that Eddie Vinson maybe had had written it, uh, that song. Uh, Tune Up is a a great tune uh, because it is really a great study of 251 chord progressions and different key centers revolving together. So there really almost isn't a a key center in the song. There isn't a parent key center. Technically, I think they usually call it D major because that's uh, kind of where it starts and where it ends. Uh, But it goes through three different key centers. It goes through concert D major. It goes through concert C major. It goes through concert B flat major. And these are not related to each other. These keys aren't related to each other at all. So they're non-diatonic to each other, but they're using just two, five, one chord progressions. There is this little bit uh, that is, I call it a detour cadence in my book uh, in there that uh, is also a great study. And Coltrane kind of took some of that 
uh, concept and ideas with his Coltrane changes, or at least that's a part of his Coltrane changes. And you can find that in Tune Up. And of course, Coltrane even wrote a contrafact over Tune Up. It's count, it's Countdown. That's that's his uh, contrafact, his melody over top of those changes. But he added his Coltrane changes. But I, I digress there. Tune Up is a great study of connecting non diatonic. Uh, non-diatonic key centers together. So uh, this is really a, a great one to study because a lot of people aren't quite sure, well, how do I do that? How do I connect uh, key centers together that are not related to each other? Well, start studying tune-up and you're going to start figuring that out pretty quick. Okay, jazz standard number four I want to talk about is Just Friends. Just Friends, and it was written by John Klenner, lyrics by Sam Lewis. Uh, and this is a really great tune. By the way, there's two common keys that this is played in. It's played in concert G major and concert F major. So it's kind of one of those tunes where you should know how to play it in two keys. And it's another one of those 32 bar A, B1, A, B2 forms. And when I say B1 and B2, it, it just simply means that the B sections are slightly different from each other. Um, and it, it's, you can play it as a ballad. You can play it as a medium tempo. You can play it up. Uh, it's one of those that everybody should know. Uh, it's a classic, classic tune. Now, this is another one of those jazz standards that's a great study of diatonic harmony, but it does some weird things. For example, it starts on the four chord and doesn't even resolve to the parent uh, tonic, the one chord, until par five. So it kind of does some weird things there. It does a little bit of a venture into the parallel minor. We call it modal modulation. And again, if this is intimidating language for you, don't don't worry about any of this stuff. I, again, when you study jazz standards, you, you start figuring this stuff out. And even if you don't even put names to, uh, you know, theoretical names, like I'm, I'm spitting out right now, two things, you start to understand why it works and how it functions and how you can connect it together with your improvisation. Uh, but it deals with some of that stuff. It deals with a concept that I call chromatic two fives, which is when you have a two five chord progression that chromatically approaches by a half step, a diatonic chord progression. Um, so there's just, there's so much to learn in Just Friends. Of course, it does this movement to the relative minor. We need to understand relative minor. I always, the jazz standard, by the way, that I always preach if you're really trying to learn the basis basics of two five ones in major and minor keys and you're trying to understand what relative and ma relative minor and relative major keys are is autumn leaves. That's the one I always talk about. But you see that happen in standards like Just Friends uh, as well. So uh, definitely would suggest Just Friends if you want to start taking things to the next level. In my book, I actually tell a really embarrassing story about this song and uh, how I got a little flustered at this master class with this great, great jazz guitarist when I was, uh, when was it? I think I was a freshman in college. And uh, when he asked me what, what, key I wanted to play the song in, I was flustered and I just said C major. Well, C major is the four chord of G, of G major and the four chord is what it starts on that song. Uh, but I, 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 I was thinking about the first chord of the song and not with the song, the key the song was actually in. Long story short, uh, it sounded horrible. I wasn't really skilled at the time to transpose and fix the problem. I had to ask the, the clinician to stop and if we could start over and I explained the problem. He was really kind to me, but it was sort of embarrassing because it was in front of a bunch of people. Anyways, lessons you learn, right? And that's lessons you learn from from playing and learning jazz standards. And whether they're uh, pretty or ugly, you learn something uh, from all of that. By the way, over Just Friends, I did a great podcast episode uh, not long ago about applying uh, pentatonic scales, pentatonic scales over the first eight bars of Just Friends. Uh, that's episode 167, making pentatonic scales musical over Just Friends. So I do a little bit of analysis of those first eight bars and then an improv lesson. Uh, so you might, might want to check that one out if that sounds uh, interesting to you. Okay, so that's Just Friends. Now, now jazz standard number five that I want to talk about is Take the A Train. Now, some of you who know Take the A Train, this is, the, of course, the uh, Billy Strayhorn tune that was written for the Duke Ellington Orchestra in 1939. It refers to the A Train in New York City, which at the time when it was written, that was a new train. Um, 
So I live in New York. So I used to take the A train all the time because uh, I lived in I lived up in Harlem. So I used to always take the A train. Uh, I don't live in uh, Harlem anymore. I live in Queens. But anyways, that's beside the point. So take the A train is a great tune. And, and for those of you who know this one, you might think, well, is this really a jazz standard that will expand my knowledge of harmony? Because actually, it's a really simple tune as far as uh, harmony goes. It's really just diatonic. It, it really sticks to the key of concert C. And yes, during the bridge, you could suggest that uh, the four chord is tonicized, meaning that it sounds as if you're in the key of the four chord, which is F major. Uh, however, there is that D7 sharp 11 uh, that's in there, the two dominant seven. So that's kind of getting into that five of five harmony, which is a weird secondary dominant, but also the sharp 11 is really pronounced not only in the melody, but usually when people improvise. So how do you approach those sharp 11 chords? Well, that opens up some lessons to be learned, right? So you, you can start digging into even just little things from songs like a chord, like how do I approach a dominant seven sharp 11 chord? Well, you got the Lydian dominant, you got to know the chord tones, and then you want to get creative and start making it musical. So just a lot of lessons, even in just take the A train. And not only that, it's one of those that's so classic, so classic that you just need to know it and knowing it, you'll, you'll be better for it as a musician. So that is take the A train. Okay, so jazz standard number six I want to talk about is Days of Wine and Roses. Now, a lot of us know this one. It's the Henry Mancini tune, lyrics by Johnny Mercer. It's for the 1962 film called Days of Wine and Roses. Okay, and uh, it's another uh, 32 bar A, B1, A, B2 form. This is a really important jazz standard. And uh, if you've been playing jazz for any time at all, you'll know that this is one of those jazz standards that's called a lot. For if, for so if, if there's any other reason why you should learn it, it's just because it's going to be called all the time, and so you kind of can't really get away with not knowing it. So this one is definitely interesting. It's kind of a study of yes, diatonic harmony again, but with some weird twists and turns in there. Um, different functions of dominant seventh chords, uh, like it's like the same dominant seventh chord, but it functions differently in the song. And how do you connect those together? And the way you think about some of these dominant seventh chords is really influential of how you're going to approach them in improvisation setting. I always say this, by the way, um, when. We, we're talking about improvising over chord changes or jazz standards. Never think, how do I improvise over a dominant seventh chord? Or how do I improvise over minor seventh chord? Or how do I improvise over a major seventh chord? That, uh, I understand where that question comes from, but you need to know the context. What chord came before it? What chord is coming after it? And even what chord comes after that one, right? So you have to understand the context. Uh, and this is one of those songs that really makes that pretty obvious, uh, so day, Days of Wine and Roses, excellent study. You, you work on this one, uh, there's going to be some questions that need to be answered for you. For example, there's a 2-5 of 3 in there that doesn't resolve. Uh, why does that work? How does that work? All all important stuff to, uh, to consider there. Um, okay, so that's the Days of Wine and Roses. I'm, I'm going to keep going through these really quick. And, and if any of these are standing out to you, you know, write it down. Like, oh, I don't know that one. Maybe I should learn that one. Maybe I should check that one out. Uh, okay. Jazz standard number seven is alone together, alone together. Now this is kind of the first jazz standard I'm talking about here that is in a minor key, uh, rather than a major key. So first of all, we need to understand how to play jazz standards in minor keys. We need to know jazz standards in minor keys. So this one's written by Arthur Schwartz with lyrics by Howard Dietz, and it was for the 1932 Broadway musical Flying Colors. Uh, I think the first recording was done by Artie Shaw. Uh, so uh, this one is in concert D minor. Now this one gets a little weird. So at first it almost feels like it's minor blues harmony, which do we need to know minor blues harmony? At, you know, the one minor to the four minor as a jazz musician? Of course we do, right? Yes. So, so just right there, it's important. But then there's some weird stuff that goes on. Uh, you have this weird B minor 7, E7 to G minor 7, C7, F major 7. And what is the B minor 7 to the E7 doing there? It seems to have nothing to do with the other chord progressions. So how do you approach that, right? This is one of the problems you face when you face uh, jazz standards like this. And you have to figure out how to do that. There's also this other really cool concept that happens uh, in this song. Uh, where 
you have this, again, I call it modal interchange. And for those of you who don't know what modal interchange is, I, I don't mean to freak you out or confuse you, but it's when you're borrowing from the parallel major or the parallel minor, a chord from that. So uh, for example, if the key of the song is D minor, the parallel major is D major. If the key of the song is D major, the parallel minor is D minor, right? So there's some of this going on where you know, you think you're going to go to the minor one chord, but instead you go to the parallel major one chord. And that's a new concept. Well, it's not a new concept, but that's a concept that comes up in this song that does happen in lots of other tunes. Uh, another one I'm thinking about is I Love You by Cole Porter, where this happens. So when you when you work on this song, you learn that concept, you start to figure out how to improvise over it. Well, you're going to see that in other jazz standards too. So is it worthwhile to learn this one? Yes, it is. So there's uh, some some of that there. There's also a tritone sub of two in there at the very end of the song. So what's a tritone sub? It's uh, where you're substituting a dominant seventh chord, a tritone interval away. Uh, and so you learn what a tritone sub of two is. Uh, again, I don't mean to freak anybody out who doesn't know a lot about jazz theory. But again, if you just start studying these songs and digging into them, you eventually figure this stuff out. And if you have a handy book like mine, <laughs> then you can you can start kind of putting some names and words to things that help you organize it in your brain. Okay, so that's alone together. Uh, let's move on to the eighth one, and that is Solar. Solar, this is by Miles Davis. Although I, I believe that... Uh, this is another one of those songs by Miles Davis that some people find there's controversy. Maybe it wasn't Miles Davis. Maybe it was somebody else, or he basically took it from somebody else. Um, but Miles Davis was known to be a little controversial like that. Uh, so this is a really great song, kind of like Tune Up. It's one of those songs that cycles through different key centers that are not diatonic to each other. So really it calls into question how to improvise over it. And it's a 12 bar form. That's the interesting thing too. So some people like to think of it as a warped minor blues. I don't really think of it that way because I'm not sure that I see the relationship so much. But um, this is a, one of those important songs that you know, you'll hear all the time. The, the one chord is a C minor major seventh chord, which is of course coming from the harmonic and melodic minor scale. If you're familiar with uh, minor harmony, which is uh, a beast in and of itself. But yeah, it, it's it's a great tune that cycles through different diatonic key center, uh, non diatonic key centers to each other, and they're connected by two five ones. So once again, another great study of two five ones. Uh, so this one is definitely one that will cause you to perhaps struggle a little bit, cause you to really have to think, cause you to have to figure out how to navigate those changes effectively, uh, how to transition from one non-diatonic key center to the next non-diatonic key center. For example, the, the song starts out in C minor, and then it moves to F major, and then it moves to E flat major, and then it moves to D flat major. But when you start understanding the intervallic relationships, you have C minor to F major. Well, that's an interval of a fourth, so that helps you remember which key center to go to next. And then you realize that F to E flat major seven is a whole step down from each other. And then E flat major seven to D flat major seven is a whole step down there. And then you understand that they're connected by two five chord progressions. And then it's really not so hard to memorize and it gets easier to understand that way. So super, it's super important to uh, just dig into the, some of this stuff. Okay. Uh, number, where are we at? Number nine, number nine. What is this thing called love? This is another tune in uh, a minor key, uh, or actually it's not in a minor key. I'm sorry. That's wrong. Uh, actually, technically the song is commonly notated in concert C major. Uh, however, it's a little bit confusing as to what key it is in at all, because, uh, we have some weird things happening with, you know, thing chords may, may or not be related to each other at all, different key centers, especially in the bridge, um, the, the move to B flat major seven, it's not related to C major at all. So this one is very interesting because it starts out with, a. Uh, a two five one to F minor seven, which is the four chord of C major, which is not the four chord of C major, but it's the four chord of the parallel minor of C major. So it's the parallel, it's the four chord of C minor. So it's weird like that. The song is very weird. Uh, 
dealing with starting with this minor two five to to F minor, but then it has this uh, I call it a hybrid two five where you mixed mix a minor two five with a major two five, so it's a D minor seven flat five G seven. That's the two five, and instead of resolving to a minor seven, it resolves to a C major seven. Uh, so also a concept that was brought to us in Alone Together as well. Um, and, and notice that all these songs, they kind of build off each other with their concepts. So I, I pick these very intentionally. So that's uh, what is this thing called love? Just a really important one to learn for sure. Now, the last jazz standard that I want to suggest that's really going to expand your knowledge of jazz harmony is The Girl from Ipanema. Now, love it or hate it, right? Because it's one of those songs where if, if, if you're a musician that's ever played casuals or whatever, someone's going to come up to you to the bandstand and be like, hey, can you play The Girl from Ipanema? And maybe you get annoyed by that. Maybe you don't. Maybe you love the song. Well, it's actually a brilliant song, though. There's so much incredible harmony in it. And Antonio Carlos Jobim uh, was a genius for writing this song. Um, he did amazing things. And, and the harmony is amazing. Now, the big takeaways from this particular tune is the bridge. The bridge is a beast. Um, and when I wrote the Jazz Standards Playbook Volume 2, I, I spent hours and hours researching the bridge, trying to figure out, how, like, what was Antonio Carlos Jobim thinking there? Because the bridge is just really weird. And I end up coming up with my own theory that I really like. It has to do with one to four chord relationships and borrowing the relative minor chords so the six chords of those keys and also this chromatic movement moving up during the bridge and the in the bass notes uh so that 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 ends up being my analysis that's uh, i can't even defend that with just those little words it's, it's i literally wrote pages and pages about this in my book so it's not something i can really uh summarize too well um, however, the other big lesson to take away from that is that Antonio Carlos Jobim, I'm 95% sure he just wrote a melody that transposes itself. You know, da di da da di da da da, right? There's the melody, and then da di da da di da da da, right? He just transposed it, and then da di da da di da da da, half step up from there, da 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 da, right? So he just he just t- took that melody and transposed it. And then, in my opinion, he just found the chords that fit there and that had some symmetry to them. Um, but there's a really interesting way to analyze that. And there's multiple ways really to analyze it. And just trying to figure out how to, how to analyze, how to navigate these chord changes in your improvisation is really a trip. And slowing this down and really understanding the intervolic and harmonic movements here. And I really think it's going to expand your, your jazz improv skills by just studying the girl from Ipanema. So that's jazz standard number 10. So really quick recap on all the 10 jazz standards that I just mentioned. We have number one, which is there will never be another you. Number two is someday my prince will come. Number three is tune up. Number four is just friends. Number five is take the A train. Number six is days of wine and roses. Number seven, alone together. Number eight is solar. Number nine is what is this thing called love? Number 10 is the girl from Ipanema. So what I would encourage you to do, and I'm always the kind of person that wants you to take action, is pick one of those songs that I mentioned today. Maybe one that you don't know, or maybe one that you maybe have worked on before, but you didn't really dig into them so hard. You know, try to pick one of those and start learning it this week. Um, You know, you can get overwhelmed by, oh, maybe I should learn all these 10. No, just pick one of them. And start really digging into it, like really start figuring out the harmony, start playing the chord tones, start figuring out what the guide tones are, uh, start analyzing the chord changes, uh, start applying, th- maybe learn a solo that you heard over that song, you know, really dig into one jazz standard really hard and try to figure it out. So pick one of these. I do believe all 10 of these are songs that do take jazz harmony to the next level for the most part. And just just by working on one of these and digging into it, you're going to be a lot better for it as a jazz musician. All right, that's all for today's show. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Hope that some of these jazz standards were helpful for you to listen and hear about and uh, again, like I said, take action and just start working on one of these and I know you're going to be better for it. And like I said, uh, all of these 10 jazz standards, I-, I picked them specifically to be in my new ebook and companion course, 
the Jazz Standards Playbook 2. So if you do want to have in-depth studies of these songs, I've already done it for you, and I can walk you through that. Uh, so just go to the Jazz Standards Playbook 2. That's the number two dot com. Jazz Standards Playbook. Uh, sorry, the Jazz Standards Playbook 2. Just the Jazz Standards Playbook 2 dot com, and you can check it out there. So uh, yes, as I always ask, if you enjoyed this episode today, leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your shows. Let other people know why you enjoy this show, how it's helped you. I do appreciate that. Uh, I'll see you next week for another episode of the Learn Jazz Standards Podcast. Until then, happy practicing. Thanks for listening to the LJS Podcast, brought to you by LearnJazzStandards.com. Subscribe to the series on iTunes, and don't forget to join our jazz community at LearnJazzStandards.com forward slash newsletter.